Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, and today we have on someone I am super excited to have on. His name, Joel Hamilton. Joel Hamilton is a guy who is actually really influential to me when I was getting started. He was a regular on the Tape Op message boards many moons ago, but he has become like a name that people know, particularly in Brooklyn, and I think increasingly nationally. Joel started his career, how long ago, Joel? Have you been in this business 20 years, 25? What do you think? Oh yeah, beyond. I mean, 25. For sure, the first record that I ever did as just an engineer came out in 96, I guess. So this guy was working in the days of ADATs and then the days of Digi001s. And in addition to having worked in some big studios, he also comes from, I think, somewhat humble beginnings that any of us can really learn from. He built with this guy, Tony. Tell me if I'm saying Tony's name right. Tony Miomi? Mamoni. Mamoni. Tony Mamoni of Per Ubu. Am I saying Per Ubu right? Yeah, that part you nailed. (laughs) Tony of uh, a very cool art rock band. Him and Joel started or really collaborated together in building a studio called Studio G from a little nothing with almost no interesting gear up to something that's become increasingly impressive. At the same time that major studios were dying left and right in Manhattan, Studio G grew from this, you know, little almost... uh, cottage industry, little boutique shop to what is now a three room facility, maybe four, five Five. room facility, man, and about to be even larger. And I really think Joel is emblematic of this idea where when I was getting into things that a lot of people thought, if you build it, they will come. If we get the right gear, get the right space, people will show up. And a lot of studios did that and nothing became of them. But I think Joel and Tony, what they've done is emblematic of, if you keep on making people come, you can build something really cool. So first of all, congrats, Joel, on uh, Studio G. It's like always getting bigger every time I hear about it. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the build it and they will come is is the thing that everybody had to drop. There's no such thing as kind of a destination studio. Like to me, that sounds as quaint as when people used to reference the number of tracks at a studio. Like, oh, we're doing our demo at a 16 track place in Midtown. <laughs> I mean, and it and it sounds funny to us at this point, but that was actually something that you would reference. And at, and at this point, I think a big part of what's happened to us is, uh, is being able to move forward with walls that are surrounding good work mm. rather than looking for work to exist within the walls that we own. We sort of put up walls around things that we were already working on. And so it gave us a place to work. Like if you were making uh, bookcases and the bookcases got really popular. Nobody knew what your wood shop looks like, but you were increasing production daily and you wound up needing to make 10 or 15 of these bookcases that were getting increasingly popular. You would probably expand the wood shop that you started and make it easier or just kind of easier to pursue the same level of quality that it took you a while to get to in your old shop, you know? I think that's an interesting thing that I really noticed by being in the room with you, because you always had a lot of gear in the time that I knew knew you. You've, you'd collected gear over the years, but it kind of made me realize that it wasn't like you bought all this gear and then went and get, gotten clients. It's like you had clients and then the gear was evidence of the work having been done. It wasn't let's buy all the gear and then get clients. It was, we're doing work and now to do this work in an even more interesting way or a more fun way or a more effective way, let's add on and add on. So this giant rack I see behind you, to me is evidence of the work that you've done in the past, not a giant rack that you're hoping will attract a bunch of clients. Absolutely. I mean, because there was no such thing as a startup loan or an inheritance or uh, any sort of significant chunk of money to 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 achieve escape velocity right off the bat. It was like, we just didn't have that gas. So basically it was like, I remember Tony counting out cash on the couch of the old studio <laughs> to buy our first 33609 from like a Russian mobster, you know? And it was like, they, <laughs> I don't know if I should even talk about this. But so, but the thing is, is like this, this type of thing, you know, to me, when I walk in here, it's why each piece is kind of a testament to sticking with it because each one is maybe something that I was able to purchase after doing this record that did well or that record or whatever. And they, each piece of gear kind of becomes stuck for better or worse with a little chunk of provenance like that, you know, where it's like, this is the thing I got after I did so-and-so's record. And, and each one is, is it's a brick, you know, and, and ultimately we, uh, there's this type of rack behind us in A and in the B room. 
and then C, D, and E have different choices and they're more sort of the standards. But A is where I'm sitting in A right now and, and it's where I normally, uh, where I'm normally mixing and stuff. So that's why you see most of my old gear here anyway. Wonderful. Well, speaking of the great work that you've done, I feel like I've just jumped right past the intro and into talking to you. I I, I can't wait whenever (laughs) I'm talking to Joel. There's always so much good stuff coming out of this guy's mouth. But for those of you who aren't deeply familiar with Joel, uh, he's been Grammy nominated at least a couple of times. I think at least one regular Grammy and at least one Latin Grammy. And uh, Seven. Uh, seven? <laughs> yeah. That's anyway, a lot. All right. Sure. Uh, he has uh, worked with, let me see, what are some of the names that people might recognize? BlackRock, um, Modest Yahoo, uh, Sparkle Horse, Bonobo, Pretty Lights. Uh, I hope I'm saying this right. Bamba Stereo. There was one of the very cool alt Latin. Am I saying it right? Uh, butcher yeah, Bomba Stadio. All right, yeah. fine, oh, good. I kind of almost got Manny Marroquin's name correct, and a lot of people yeah. said, why are you saying his name wrong? It's Marroquin. Anyway, moving <laughs> onwards, uh, he's working Nora with- Nora Jones. <laughs> I worked with Nora Jones. That's easier to, to say oh, right. than Nora- Bomba Stadio. <laughs> <laughs> so he has worked with a lot of artists. Big for me, I don't know if it's big for all of you guys, Mark Rabot, one of my favorite guitar players of all time, and also on some uh, projects that uh, Joel has done as a musician, uh, The Book of Knots, which if you haven't checked out, you should. Tom Waits is on that record, so he gets to say he's worked with Tom Waits, which is fantastic. So really cool career, and they keep on doing more and more stuff. And every time I watch Sesame Street with my uh, daughter these days, at the end credits, it says, uh, you know, uh, we worked on this at Studio G, which always brings a smile to my face. So congrats on all that. And now, congrats also to you guys for getting this 90 seconds or so of pure bliss where I shout out this week's sponsors. Are you ready for it? Plugin Alliance. Guys, Plugin Alliance are a very cool software brand. They were actually excited to sponsor an episode with Joel on it because they're big fans of Joel. And Plugin Alliance are having a huge sale right now. If you're interested in picking up plugins, they have some stuff that's literally up to 95% off at the moment for their big summer sale. Go check them out at plugin-alliance.com. That's plugin-alliance.com. The makers of uh, the Brainwork stuff, Alicia, um, who else? SPL. There's a whole bunch of cool brands under the hood. And Brainworks is especially interesting because those guys, the German engineers there, have actually made a a lot of the best sounding plugins for other companies whose names I will not name uh, at this very moment. In addition to Plugin Alliance, we also have sponsoring this week, Sound Toys, sponsoring from the beginning. I remember the very first time I sat in a studio with Joel looking over his head at what he was doing, he was playing around with Echo Boy for quite some time. So I think you have some Sound Toys Makes plugins sense. there as well, Joel. I, I have the bundle and I love all of them for sure. Good stuff. Last but not least, another great maker of effects, both software and hardware, Eventide. Check them out, eventideaudio.com. That's Eventide Audio. Joel's nodding on that one too. I don't know if there are any plugins or tools that Joel doesn't have, but apparently all of these three get approval from him. So if you want to try out anything they make for free, check them out at either plugin-alliance.com, soundtoys.com, eventideaudio.com. Some really great brands. And uh, let's get into it. Joel. Thank you for joining me for this week's podcast. Let me introduce you to these listeners for the first time who have not heard you talk yet. Um, man, so you got involved in audio a little while after Tony was in uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And where you guys started Studio G was in, I guess you'd call it East Williamsburg or Bushwick. And when he started there, he moved there in like 1984, long before there was anything he was, like. He was still in, he was still in, in Williamsburg because he, he moved, it was, that was at, at like right by Kellogg's. Right. Uh, which, which is, uh, which is kind of the heart of Williamsburg actually. Right. You well, know? it is now, but different pa- neighborhood designations change in New York like every 10 years. So Yeah, I know. But that one's deeply centered though, because it's right at where the BQE crosses Metropolitan. I mean- you know, it's not the north side, it's not the south side, it's kind of the middle of traditional Williamsburg. The heart of the original Williamsburg. Well, yeah, I yeah. guess the commercial strip in Williamsburg, what a lot of people think of when they think of Williamsburg, is would have technically been Greenpoint at some point, but now a lot of people refer yeah, to that as Williamsburg. Exactly, yeah. because Bedford north of North 7th, which this is outside the scope of our conversation, but oh Bedford goodness. north of North 7th Street was Greenpoint. You know, when you get off the train, if you walk north, you were in Greenpoint immediately. We are currently boring everyone outside yeah, of New York, I know. but the people... <laughs> People, the, the New York engineers who are still there, like, yeah. oh my they're like, God, yeah, they're totally. My language. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, but just to give people in more broad strokes a perspective of what was Williamsburg like when you guys were first working on Studio G there? Because it was a different world, I think, when Tony first moved in there, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was like you would have to fight with 
yellow cab drivers, you know what I mean? Like for if you got a yellow taxi, like a regular New York City taxi, which is yellow, if you got one of those guys and and you told them the address and it was over the Williamsburg Bridge, they would pretend that the meter was broken and they'd start like <laughs> pumping the brakes and really do some shoddy, like, you know, trying to make it seem like the engine had died or whatever when yeah. you watch them turn off the car. So it was a different place. You had to convince people to come out there at the time. But it was also where you could get more more for your buck than in the East Village. And so if we were doing the basic tracking at Avatar and then bringing the ADAT back over with a submix of your 24 track, you know, with just a submix to track seven, eight on an ADAT or whatever, you could then load up two more tapes and have, you know, 22 more tracks and then bring that in and slave it back and mix it in a real room. Cause at that point it was more like a cross between a rehearsal space and a studio with like a Soundcraft ghost in it, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when did it, uh, was that where you were really starting cutting your teeth and making most records? Or do you also have the side of you that came up through some major studios? I don't really know the Joe Hamilton origin story. I came up through, I came up through a bunch of studios. One was in Kansas city, Missouri, because I was playing in a band called Shiner that was from out there. And I moved out there and was playing with them. And I was partners in a studio called West end. The owner's name is Mike Miller. And he was a huge influence on me. He's still doing it. That studio still exists. It's been around since the eighties. And it's like just one of those awesome kind of classic, really well-built studios. There's an MCI 500 in it that's like one of the best, if not the best one I've ever worked on in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a beautiful little studio out there, completely pro, had everything that you needed. You know, it's where I was using a timeline links to, to slave two 24 tracks together and wrote an article for Larry about it in tape op like two or something like that. Mm -hmm. I wrote it by hand because I didn't have a computer to type it out on. And the thing is, is like there were, there were a bunch of studios like that, that I was doing things in when I had moved past my like four track phase in the mom's basement type of thing, you know? Right, right. So ultimately I wound up with like my own little studio in Kansas city called train wreck that had a 16 track, two inch MCI in it and an autotronics console that I lost in those big floods in the nineties that everybody saw on the news during that time when the, the Mississippi overflowed. I'm not from out there. I had only moved out there to play in this band and stuff. Just for posterity, uh, those of you who are, uh, ever, experience flood damaged gear again, Joel actually contributed to an article we put together when there were some huge floods in Brooklyn that wiped out, I believe it was called the South Sound. And you were helping them kind of restore some gear, putting them through the triage, what you can do with flood damaged gear. Some people don't realize you could take some of these pieces and before turning them on, hopefully flush out all of that crud water. And then you brought us through a step-by-step process for, man, if your studio ever gets flooded, here's how you can at least salvage some of this stuff. And some of the gear comes back to life after that. So anyone who we, ever oh, runs yeah. into this, look it up. We we saved those guys, you know, like fifteen to $20,000. I mean, it was like, there was, you know, when you, when you have an SSL bus comp or something that's like, you know, once we washed it out, it worked. Once we washed out the distressors and you, you run water in them until they run clear. I mean, I learned this, that guy, Mike Miller, that I just referenced at West End Studios. That's where I learned this because he helped us recover some of our gear that was in the flood in Kansas city. And he had gotten things like 24 track machines from fire damaged, you know, places that, that it's mostly water. Like if something burns, you know, upstairs in the apartment and then water comes down through it. That's what happened at a studio in, in Kansas city. It was actually in Branson. He went and got the tape machine and he was showing me pictures of him, like loading all the repro and and record cards into his dishwasher and just running it without the heating element on and no soap Mm -hmm. so that it would actually just completely get all of the crud out of there. And then you just have to dry them completely and and make sure all the water is displaced before you turn it back on. But it's, it's amazing what can be brought back. The water is not the thing that kills it. Water and electricity together will mess it up. (laughs) Yeah. 
I hear you. It's it's really the like the corrosive elements that are creating electrical connections where there shouldn't be electrical connections, and yeah. then frying stuff by electricity going ways it's not supposed to. But if you can yeah. flush that stuff out, it's surprising what you can do. So for anyone who wants to look this up, uh, the title here is called "How to Recover Flood Damaged Audio Gear." If you ever find yourself, and honestly, it's just an interesting article to read because it's like, man, who knew? It's a cool step by step process. You can check it out there. It was originally on TrustMeI'mAScientist.com, my old rag, right, and it's right. uh, I will now port it over to Sonic Scoop. So it's there for all of posterity. I'll include the link in the show notes. So going from Kansas City onwards, when did you know it was time to move on from Kansas City? Why did you make the move? And did you go directly to New York from there? I did. I, I came back to New York. The girl that I was with at the time, she and I moved there. And uh, she's a textile designer and I do music stuff. And it was just a smart place for us to be. And that was 98 I finished out the last couple tours with Shiner as a New York, as a Brooklyn resident. I lived right across the street from, from old Studio G that Tony had started years before I got involved in it. Basically, that studio getting robbed, because Brooklyn was a different place at this point, mm -hmm. Tony's old studio getting robbed was a big part of me becoming a partner with Tony because I had all my stuff at Mission with Oliver at the time. I was sort of working out of Mission Studios. That's uh, Oliver Strauss, Mission Sound, nearby. For those of you guys who don't know the area, it's like a stone's throw away from where Studio G was. Big room. An incredibly beautiful studio. Really, really great place. It always has been. It continues to get better all the time with a beautiful Neve in it and a really great live room. And I did a bunch of great projects there. That's where I recorded that Sparkle Horse stuff was oh. at Mission. And um, But anyway, the... Uh, Tony got robbed. And so I was like, man, I'm, I'm going to bring some stuff over there for Tony to use because he didn't have any compressors or anything. And he still had sessions booked. And he got home from a tour with Ronnie Size. He was playing with like the Represent crew, which are like drum and bass artists from the 90s. So I brought like my Spectrasonics comps and all the stuff that I had at the time over there. And we just kind of hit it off. And, you know, now here we are. 20 years later we've been business partners for 20 years now you Good know stuff, and man. uh but so you know that that kicked it off like to answer your question that kicked off the beginning of refining what it meant to be studio g like as soon as i brought in some more pro gear all of a sudden it was time to think about getting rid of that that soundcraft ghost that beloved little soundcraft ghost and move to the next console and i got this autotronics thing in there you know, and, and with every project, it was like, if I had a $3,000 budget, I had to make it sound like the, the band or label had spent 10000 and And our overhead was low enough that I could put a lot of that into gear for the next one, you know. And, and it was built with compassion and empathy because both of us came from that side of the glass. So it was like, what's really going to matter to the presentation of this person's performances rather than like to, for me personally to like twiddle some knobs that I think look cool on the internet or whatever. It was much more, there was much more empathy and, and compassion built into the choices like, okay, a parallel 33609 or 33609 as a bus compressor in the beginning. It was like that helped me put together mixes that were much more flattering for a drummer in particular than what I was previously able to do with what I was using, you know? Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when did you kind of get the inkling that you could move on or should move on from that initial Studio G space to this new monster, what, 5,000 square foot, soon to be more space that you're in now? It's 10,000 square feet. We have two floors, which mm -hmm. is the whole building. We started off with just the upper floor of a two-story building, 5,000 square feet and three rooms. So A, B, and C are upstairs with a common lounge. And then downstairs, there's now two production suites that are private and the C and D rooms. And then the, oh, excuse me, and the D and E rooms. And then what's soon to be the E room is tied to D as both of those are tied to what's going to be F, right. which F is going to be a wide open. It already is a wide open 950 square foot tracking room um, that's going to have two rooms tied to it as control rooms. So it'll be Brooklyn's largest live room soon. We're, Might we're be one of that New York City's last. biggest studios uh, coming up at this point with there being no more Avatar and such. You guys, are you guys going to be like the biggest studio in New York City once those are online? Well, I mean, the bunker's beautiful and they have a whole bunch of great stuff. Um, are they still the, two the, big rooms there at the bunker? 
They have the A room is gigantic there. It's like um, mini avatar kind of thing, yeah. Kind of, yeah. And then but then the B room is smaller and then they have kind of mix and and uh mastering suites there as well. But their sort of main live room is really beautiful. But the this one that we're building is really kind of like uh a multifunction space because we've seen the way things have been going for us and and what we need is basically it's like this we have 10,000 square feet now and having every single square inch of it being purpose built we needed something that was multifunction so something that acts as you know an entire symphony space or broadway cast album space like avatar's all day room but then could also have some temporary risers in it for a private showcase with a small PA, you know, things like this. Um, there's been a lot of filming, things like this, multi, multi-function space, having Sesame Street work here, as you referenced in the intro. I mean, really, that's that's one of the proudest things for me is the fact that I watched Sesame Street with my kid and then it's being all the audio being done at Studio G in a room that I designed. I mean, I was the architect for Studio G and designed every single inch of all of these rooms. And and so having things like, I mean, right now the In the Heights cast album is being done in the B room. And, and again, seeing things of that caliber having moved from Avatar that was designed by legendary people, staffed by legendary people, you know, just manned in general by legends for so many years, it's amazing to feel some of that energy aimed at rooms that we built and we built it with money that we generated in the in this tiny, you know, dress shop storefront over on Union that we we just worked there for years and then made this kind of financial Snake River Canyon jump mm-hmm. over over to the other side of the park and and now here we are with a multi-room facility that's thriving. Yeah, it really is a beautiful story. And it was interesting for me to see it kind of happen in slow motion when I was uh, living there and see you guys, you know, first of all, that that one studio turn from how it started to a really great, you know, significant project studio in New York, and then turn into this 5,000 square foot three room facility, which was your first jump. You didn't jump right to yeah. 10,000 square feet, no, no. six or seven rooms. And now this other big jump. And when I said biggest studio in New York, I meant like, as far as like compound size goes, like number of studios that used to be a norm once upon a time in, in New York, but obviously it's become less and less of a norm. And that was the other thing I got to see in slow motion, things in Manhattan, you know, scaling down, 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 smaller, smaller, and looking across the East River and seeing Studio G growing, the bunker growing into a significant studio. And the guys from the bunker, for those of you who don't know, were, uh, at least one of them was an assistant for uh, Joel at the original Studio G. One for of six Brooklyn's- years. John yeah. was my assistant for years. He you was know. your main guy before uh, Francisco, yeah. I think, who came in uh, after. Before Mark Goodman, oh, who also it, then opened Strange Weather. That which was the next one I was going to say. As well. One of my favorite rooms in all of Brooklyn is Strange Weather. It's a great sounding yep. room designed by Wesley Show. And that was another Joel assistant. So it was mm-hmm. cool to see all of those rooms kind of crop up and serve the purpose that the Manhattan rooms used to serve. And when they originally cropped up, I mean, so much more affordable for musicians and producers than were mm-hmm. the Manhattan studios. And uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been nice to, to watch it grow, man. So why and how did you go from 5,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet? How did you make that jump? Well, the, I would say the biggest reason was going back to the table with the landlord and asking for a long-term lease if we're going to take over that many square feet. Mm-hmm. And so having secured a future where my daughter will be long out of college by the time we have to leave. It's like at this point we knew we could really invest because we weren't going to have to turn over a build out investment in five years or something crazy. I mean, let's put it this way in New York city, way more studios have been taken out by real estate than by Spotify, Napster, LimeWire, and you know, any of the things that, whatever was catching the blame in any particular era, you know, like if it started with pirating, you know, and then it started with streaming and, you know, all of this stuff, it's like all of that has been blamed for things changing. And, you know, you go to AES and everybody's just like weeping on the floors together. And it's amazing that it really was real estate all along. I mean, most of the time it's like all of these classic rooms that secured a 20 year lease 
which is the classic commercial lease in New York City. If they if they got one in 94, all of a sudden in 2004, they were in big trouble yep. because that old model just did not meet the needs of what was happening in 2004. And it happened, yes, to coincide with a bunch of new media and all kinds of things changing. And so the ability to adapt on the 30th or 31st of their last month of their current lease would be, was impossible. There's no way you're going to change in 24 hours between when your 20 year lease is up and your first year of your next 10 comes up. There's no way your business model is going to all of a sudden do a backflip. You know what I mean? And become this financial superhero that can just kind of like run down the street in whatever direction it needs to go. So, I mean, we, our, our entire business model was predicated on community, which sounds lofty and a bit more Oprah-esque than I intended it to as it came out of my <laughs> mouth. But it, was, but it was based on community in the sense that we weren't a business looking to generate money. We were a community of engineers that needed somewhere to work. And so the more we worked on bigger projects, Tony and I, and then all of a sudden bringing in Chris Cubetta as another partner, there's now three partners in Studio G. So there's just three of us at the top of it. And then there's a bunch of engineers that work out of here that that are emotionally and financially sort of invested in the well-being of the place, whether it's with their gear that lives here, or, you know, if somebody has some microphones here and they get special consideration on booking prices, it's, it's run as a community. And, uh, but with three owners that that still ultimately bear the brunt of the monthly nut, right. <laughs> you know. But so you know, I mean, moving moving towards a community based business model allowed us to scale up and down for the community we were serving. And I started to recognize when I'd be working at a studio in Istanbul or in the north of Norway or in L.A. or wherever it was that the priorities of the community that a studio serves seems to be reflected so directly in the condition of any given room in that community. Meaning like if you go to a professional studio in LA, what matters to the way people work in that city is going to be reflected in what's working and what's broken and what's dusty and what's shiny in any room. If mm -hmm. you're in the village and you're in the D room, which I just was, I mean, that was built for uh, Fleetwood Mac. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's like the the Stevie Nicks ISO with like places to hide pills or whatever the hell the stories are. I don't even know, but it has its own bathroom and, you know, think all those like cute stories that old studios have. And it's like, that thing just has like a console in it and a couple compressors and like a lexicon and that's it. And it's like, there's a really good big giant screen on the pro tools rig and some mains that may or may not cut in or out. And it's like, that's, that's the priorities being revealed to me in what's cared for. And, and what we wound up wanting to do was show that there's a community of engineers that actually have very diverse needs here. And so what we wind up with is a well-aligned tape machine or like an 827 that works perfectly in one room and an MCI JH24 in the other. And everything works. There's no sort of heartbreaking channel on the Neve that's not going to work for you. And that that comes from us just caring about it and diverting funds that we bring in as a as a facility to keep up the place. Meaning we generate zero dollars as owners by just owning the studio. We act as an engineer that has a good deal on a room, but we pay into the pot to make the studio work. So therefore, it's like keeping things up, keeping things maintained with all this vintage gear around. Again, it's all cute to have these big knobs around, but if all they are is just one series of heartbreak after the next for an, an outside engineer coming in and trying to work, it gets a it gets a reputation really quickly that everything's broken. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So having having a sort of collective run the place and and people are required to like you know fix their stuff we have a tech here mike rippy at analog audio repair which again we don't pay him a salary but he works on the gear every single day and we give him space you know to have his bench and his shop working out of here which is another thing that expanded in our ten thousand square foot expansion was to have a tech shop with a drill press for more custom racking and you know uh 
just just a more classic tech shop to be able to manufacture things rather than just fix your compressor, you know. But but that even works as a part of a larger collective space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, uh, this owner operator paradigm is, I think, hard to compete with if you kind of come from this uh, old school top-down approach where there is this window in the recording industry where that made sense. But if you look at the beginning of the recording industry, it's a lot closer to what you're describing with guys like yeah. Bill Putnam and all these studio owners who were owner-operators, and they basically had a passion, a vocation, a career they were looking to pursue, and they had to learn business and how to build up a profitable, sustainable business around that so they could keep on doing the things they wanted to do every single day. And that was kind of where things came from. And maybe there was this middle period where you could have, the gear was exclusive enough where you could have this top down, hey, let's plan out a spot and then look to put people into it. But it's kind of come full circle in a way. And it's uh, refreshing to hear the way you talk about it. Yeah. Absolutely. I reference Cosmo Matassa all the time because I got to hang out with him at a few of the tape op con things and in a few other circumstances. He did like Little Richard records and stuff. He was like a New Orleans legend. Mm -hmm. And- he would talk about, he's the one that would talk about how it would be freezing in his place because he would have his dad's produce shop. And again, this always sound, seems quaint, but it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a reality that like these hits were recorded there. Like it's hard to, it's hard to sort of like remove ourselves from today's paradigm and think about the fact that like Little Richard hits were being recorded in a produce shop that had to be refrigerated in New Orleans. And he said like, you know, Richie didn't mind because he could leave his fur on, you know, like he'd have all these like cute little quotes like this. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that he absolutely, it's why I could relate to him and it resonated so deeply to hear him talk because it was his passion that drove him to push the, like his dad's racks of like produce out of the way, roll out the piano and his gear that he maintained you know, along with help from friends that maybe knew more about the tape machine or whatever at the time, but he learned as he went, just like I did. And, and like you said, created a sort of viable model within the confines of whatever he was getting paid at the time, which I have no idea, you know, Lord knows how he would, how he even got the money when there'd just be like, you know, the crazy days of somebody coming in and said jamming at three in the morning and it became a hit. And then he would go chase their money. Um, I mean, that type of thing is like, <clears throat> that just resonates so deeply with, with Studio G as a whole. Like we would all agree on that because it's the energy of the crisscross. When I'm doing like an Aaron Neville record and there's a punk band in C and something happening in, in B with Tony and, and all those people come together in the lounge, like shit, having a common lounge was a big part of this kind of communal effort. And we wanted that to read in the way it was designed. Even the way the storage works here is communal. Like none of the rooms have individual storage. It's like all the drums are in one place. All the amps are displayed in a particular place. And it means you're going to wind up shoulder to shoulder if Rebo's coming out to like grab a deluxe, which is what he would probably grab immediately. <laughs> and, and, you know, and then there's some like metal kid working in some other room at the same time. Inevitably, they wind up in the same place at the same time. And there's some cross pollination there, which is, again, part of those sort of legendary stories where so and so sang backups on so and so's record because they were in the adjacent rooms at Avatar. Right, you know, or the Hit Factory, or something. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's good to see that being kept alive in New York because it's one of the beautiful things about being in a large city is you actually being around people, you know, in yeah. a, in a collaborative way. And it's like, man, if you're in a city like New York and you're not creating those actual person to person interactions, it's almost like why are you there? So it's great to see you guys keep that going. Another thing that's come full circle a little bit. I just want to touch on that real estate thing. You kind of blew my mind a little bit. This I, I, I just want to investigate it a little bit. First of all, I think you're right. When the um, Napster came and all that stuff, first of all, music revenues did go down for musicians and labels, but studio revenues didn't necessarily go down that period. In that period from like 2000 to 2010, uh, I run the numbers on this a few times, the actual incomes for audio engineers went up, the number of audio engineers working in the field went up, uh, they just weren't necessarily working in the same kinds of places. So th there's like a truism on the one side, yeah, it did hit musicians, but actually audio engineers kept on doing okay because more and more people were making music. Um, yeah. But an interesting thing there, when you're talking about real estate driving it, 
two things I want to throw out there. One, correct me if I'm wrong, and I could be wrong on this, but when places like Avatar and all these big midtown Manhattan studios were cropping up, I don't think those neighborhoods were like the most expensive, the place to be neighborhoods. No, they were scary. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah, that's there was, what I'm there were scary about. places. I mean, that's the whole point. That's why we're like when Williamsburg was was scary. Mm -hmm. It's why we were able to get what we got at the time. I mean, it's absolutely. It's just the exact same story. It's just mm -hmm. that we're not talking about 48th Street and 10th Avenue anymore. We're talking about something in Brooklyn now, but it still has, I mean, real estate prices here, which again, we, I don't want to go too deep into like <laughs> New York centric, but, but I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that it's, it's, it's repeating and, and it's why we needed to expand basically just to be able to go back to the table with, with our landlord and secure a future for what we had already built. And then thankfully we were able to expand into that downstairs space and, and create more opportunities for people to work at the same time. Just another, another thing for people to be aware of if they're in a, what's becoming a hot market like yours, I'll tell you one thing that got us at Joe Lambert Mastering. I was mastering at the original Joe Lambert Mastering in Dumbo. And uh, I think it was, I forget what year now, 2015 or so, that there was a clause in the lease that the landlord had put in there, which was, if we have the opportunity to sell this building as luxury condos, we can kick yeah. you out of your lease at any time. And they used that clause. And it was only, you know, who knows how many years into Joe's lease. And it's like, whoa, that is something I'll upend you. So for people who are in, you know, hot markets or what could potentially become hot markets, it's something to look out for. You know, the length of your lease isn't necessarily the length of your lease if there are these clauses in there. And a lot of old studios are now condos, residential. It was just the real estate was more valuable that way than Completely. the studios. I think, a, I think a big part of what we're discussing today is it has to do with learning on your feet as well. Because it's like, unless you are a real estate person or whether you read contracts for a living or whether you, you know, something that's outside the usual confines of recording engineer, then it's difficult to be an owner operator unless it's just like an, a wing of your mansion or you have a farm in <laughs> Vermont or something, you know, yeah, like, I mean, cause that. that old, that old story though, you know, where there's sort of like you buy, you find a house with a good two car garage and you build a beautiful studio studio in it or whatever, because then you're your own landlord. It's much like everyone's personal trajectory as a recording engineer. I think as a business owner, you find yourself with the same personalized trajectory. There's a set of circumstances and variables that are going to be so specific to the time and place that you're ready to expand, that it's really difficult to give any sort of advice for somebody coming up behind me when people ask me about this type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's But what, I, what I've said again and again, though, is just to basically be as diverse a human as you possibly can, because guess what? Running a chop saw while I was building this upstairs by myself, I mean, meaning with the help of a bunch of other people, but like running the saw. I mean, like we built it. It wasn't a contractor built thing. I designed it and built it with me and a bunch of friends and people who work here. That's because I had done framing as a crappy summer job as a kid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had done drywall. I had done all of these things. I had built a million skateboard half pipes because I was a sponsored skateboarder in the eighties, you know, and like done all of this stuff. So I wasn't going to I most likely wasn't going to lose a finger using a chop saw and putting this stuff together. The bunker did the same thing. They had a, they had an architect design it and then they executed the designs on their own with some friends. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's because John Davis, the owner there, one of the owners is, is a well-rounded human. And, and I've never been prouder than when he's saying things like, well, you know, that I was a big influence in being able to put the soul in a place rather than just have gear and just, you know, actually create something that does feel like a community. And those guys have absolutely done that. There's a whole group of guys and girls there, just like there is at Studio G, that are like-minded individuals. And that's why that place is thriving, because people sort of invest themselves in the well-being of the space rather than the old public room that gets treated like the men's room at JFK. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you go in and there's like buttons broken off of everything because people just like hit them until they work. I mean, it's that classic kind of thing where you, you can minimize repair costs, maintenance costs by actually giving a shit about the people that are working with you and working at your studio. Because then all of a sudden you have somebody like yourself, Justin, if you're working out of here, we all know that you're not a like smash the button till it works kind of person. It's like we would, 
we sort of curate the people that work here. It's not just a public space. And so we wind up with this family vibe, you know, it's, it's why the guys from Sesame Street, it's why Bill Sherman, the producer of Hamilton's records and, you know, the producer of all of these different Broadway castings, he's doing the In the Heights thing right now. He also does Sesame Street. It's why he loves working here because there's never just rando people coming through. It's always like by extension, because it's word of mouth only, basically, it's there's sort of this automatically this automatic pasteurization that occurs. You know what I mean? Like where you 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 wouldn't mention it to somebody that you think is going to be a liability. And so these mm. sort of the impurities kind of go away automatically, you know? And and so you wind up with people that if I bump into them in the lounge, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna like them. And it's amazing what that does to your day-to-day bottom line actually when we're talking about a place that requires maintenance and requires uh resources to be to keep working well you know i mean there's so many variables here with vintage gear right right sure now turning gears uh just a little bit here i'm curious what made you stick with New York. And there's a good answer there, which is you're already tied to Studio G, the original one, which is doing pretty well. But right when Studio G was coming up, there was a, a bit of an exodus of producer and en- engineers from New York to LA. So sell me on New York, why people should be making records in New York, why it's still relevant to people making art today. Why do you prefer to be there rather than somewhere else? Well, as I mean, I can only answer it with, again, a sort of personalized trajectory. I love the fact that Rebo can dip in and play on one song and didn't get here. You know, like we don't need cars. The sort of suburban lifestyle that I fought to escape growing up on Cape Cod exists in LA. There's just prettier people. <laughs> and I fought to escape that way of living entirely. Like I... I love the fact that people are kind of in and out here rather than like camped out. The, the I, I did a session at, at Rick Rubin's place at Shangri-La and it was like, I felt all but like once I came inside the compound, it was like the village. Have you ever watched The Prisoner? Mm-hmm. It was like, mm-hmm. it was like, I just kind of was there and there were runners and it was very beautiful. And there were runners that, to drive from Malibu, the like 17 hours or whatever it is in LA to go to the deli for me, right. you know, to drive 10 hours across town to get yeah. me a sandwich. And, and the way things worked every single time that I've been in a studio in LA is that there, it's more like people are there for the whole day and you camp out rather than just having somebody come through with a saxophone, a guitar, a unique instrument that you don't know the name of to play on somebody else's record. And even just the diversity, meaning like it might be a Rajasthani bulbul player that's coming through to play on some hip hop person's record because they're friends from the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And to me, the, the, that's the beauty of the New York scene in general, rather than this sort of flower crown coachella out idea of diversity, which is like curated and booked by a promoter with a cool idea of what different is. And I'm not dissing LA. What I'm talking about is for me personally, is that the, the way it works is something that just never made sense to my brain in a vibrant recording atmosphere in a city like New York, where somebody jumps off the train, comes in and plays something like a Rebo plays on one song on a band from Norway that I'm working with. And then that now is like a feature for that band. And it was like a quick chunk of money for Rebo and he can get back on the train and go see his daughter. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just so different. Like the time and space thing is so different in New York, the way it's allocated. I feel like, I feel like my personal calendars uh, resolution is finer than any of my friends in LA. Mm -hmm. Like 15 minutes is actually a viable chunk of time to do something in the studio in New York. Mm -hmm. And it's just not happening that way when you have, like it takes 15 minutes to enter the gate code at (laughs) Shangri-La and and come like, you know, get in and have like a, a matcha latte before you do your overdub. You know what I mean? Like it takes longer. Right. I actually remember once upon a time, I think following one of your social media feeds and you posting that you were annoyed about a, a guitar player arriving really late for a session where there were a bunch of people like set up and we're waiting on this one guy. And I'm like, that is something people say in New York. I don't know if people would say that in LA. I mean, obviously everywhere you should be on time if you want to be professional, but I don't know. There's just a different... There's a different sense of urgency in New York than other places in the world, maybe. 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I don't know enough about like I've never lived in LA and I probably never will and again, it's not I'm not dissing LA. There's so much great stuff that comes out. I was about to say there. shots fired, but go on, yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's just such, you know, it everything there's so much good about it and and but there's there is a a sense of urgency, I think that I thrive on here for mm-hmm. sure. That's a good way of putting it. The way you just said that. Yeah. It's definitely, I was afraid to leave. I don't live in New York uh, right now. I live in New Hampshire. I actually did the suburban thing to have a, a kid, which to me yep. made sense. I know you've raised a kid in the city with great success, but for me, it just, uh, it made sense to get out. But that was one of those things I was really fearful of leaving because I'm like, I don't know. I don't, first of all, I don't know if I can handle the rest of the world or if the rest of the world can handle me. Like I'm used to going at this pace. I feel myself talking faster, even just getting on the podcast with you again. And yeah, uh, yeah it really gets into your soul and into your pores. I mean, the, the spirit of the place and the pace of the place. All right. So we are in uh, New York fashion, almost just ripped through talking for an hour. I, I'm going to have to, to keep people from, keep the lynch mob, uh, you know, at bay, or at least, you know, relaxed. Uh, I have to ask you about some of the gear behind you. So can you give sure. us like a little 180 or 360 view of this for people who are watching the video version? And then maybe just tell us a, a few pieces that you're really happy to have that have either been with sure. you a long time. You mean time actually before. move the camera? Here? Yeah, if you can, if you okay. can pick it up, yeah, just yeah, like give us course. a little tour, show us your desk, just give us a little quick overview. And if there's right. any pieces you want to hover on for a second because they have a special place in Joel Hamilton's heart, you know, feel well, free. Well, that's most of my gear, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? Sure, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so behind me here is a bunch of the crap that I use to make records. and uh, Oh, I crap, clearly. That, yeah, complete crap. Um, let's see here. There's, there's some interesting ones down here, Mm -hmm. like this thing, which these guys are kind of cool. Awesome at the, uh, what are these? These are Martin Audio Corp PEQ 500A equalizers. They're like a passive non-tube EQ kind of thing. They are like a cross between a Lang solid state and the Poltex that have the API makeup game. Hmm. Um, someone who's older than me and probably worked at Martin Audio will probably email me or you and tell me that I'm wrong, but they're, they basically <laughs> have like, they're basically like the, the selectable low, mid and high um, with a bandwidth control on the high. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like a Lang in that sense. They're, they, they remind me mostly of something like uh, like the the Silverface Pultex with the API makeup gain. They kind of sound like that, or some they they have an API ish mid range, like really kind of hard mids. I use them on guitars quite a bit. You do have a lot of unusual stuff that a lot of people wouldn't uh, expect to see. I mean, some of them, like the obvious ones, who's someone watching it on video right now would probably pick out would be the Distressors, the Chandlers. There's an LA two A over your head. There is the Alicia, but there are other Mugs. things that people don't see uh, a lot of. I was about to say the Mogs. People know of them a lot through. I think Plugin Alliance has kind of made their name kind to come back up to a wider audience but there's a lot of things you don't see like the mogs like the the, the martins you were just pointing to there's some really interesting there's a uh, uh tube compressors over to your left and now a rack of neves and are those calrex uh no they're they're neves as well it's just the my console uses 33 114 eq so these are the 10 spares that i have wow but they live in the a room here which is the ssl room so the neve room in b uses those and then I have a, an 80 series rack with some weird ones just because I always have the weird ones. Like these are 1076s, mm-hmm. which is just the 1073, but with two dB stepped controls on every single boost and cut. Interesting. So it's like go bold or go home kind of EQ. Kind of. I mean, I guess from a mastering engineer's perspective. Right. Two dB. Yes, yes. You're like two dB. Go <laughs> yeah. bold, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, but I don't know. There's a lot of people, even in mixing, who get these bad habits in their mind that they're only supposed to EQ a little bit and they're only supposed to cut because magazines teach them to do that and their introductory textbooks teach them to I do, don't. That. do that. But I know, but when you actually work <laughs> with people who are like making records, it's like, yeah, why would you EQ like a dB? I don't know. I mean, I guess you could do that every once in a while, but come on, we're trying to have an effect here. 
I crank the shit out of things until they sound good <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I, I hear you. And every once in a while, that happens to me in mastering. Someone will send me a record. They'll be like, it doesn't sound like this. They'll give me all their references. I send it back to them. They say, it sounds great. What did you do? And I said, all the shit you were afraid to do in mixing, I like, you know, had cuts and boosts of 6 dB and 4 dB and all this stuff. And uh, timidity often makes for some really lame, lifeless uh, mixes. Always. Mm -hmm. Not often. Always. Okay, wait, I'm pulling the SM7 over here because this one's important. Yes, please. All right, so the, this box here is something that I'm almost reticent to talk about, but mm -hmm. it's amazing. The Magnatech 31B, mm. right? <clears throat> this thingy here, it is, all you get is de-esser and compress, and then there's a release time. That's what you get. There's no input or output or anything. And it's 140 volt rails. Um, and basically it's the type of thing that somehow nobody knows what it is. And then you do a Google search quickly and then you're like, oh, wow. On the Capitol Records gear list for their A room in like, you know, this is handwritten. So I don't even know what year this was written, but they have Fairchild 001. Then the next thing that's listed were four of these Magnatech 31Bs because they were used so frequently with uh, dialogue mixing. Um, and that super high headroom, like I said, the 140 volt rails, it's the type of thing where when the guy gets shot in the Godfather and falls off a balcony and screams and somehow it doesn't distort, but it gives the illusion of this massive dynamic range, it's something like that doing it. Um, where it can impart massive amount of gain reduction. That thing has just been parked on my vocal chain lately. For about the last two years, I've had that thing on everything that I've been mixing. It's an amazing box, and I'm looking for more. So if anybody has one, tell me. I'll buy it immediately. <laughs> All right. Now, years ago, when I did have the uh, luxury of, of sitting there in a room and, and watching you mix, I noticed, at least back then, that you had some pretty, uh, I would say, sophisticated or or complex vocal chains where you had many different boxes. You seem to be really into serial compression at that point on vocals. Is that still mm -hmm. part of your approach, you know, using several compressors on a vocal? It is, but I mean, there's sort of one less only because I'm mixing primarily on the SSL these days. Mm. And when you were there, I was mixing on that Neve still, and there's not any dynamics built into the console. And so into that particular Neve. And so on the SSL, I mean, I have, it's an 8,000 G plus, and so basically that's like a 4,000 channel strip with the routing of a 9K, uh, sort of like the surround stuff and the ABCD buses and stuff like that. And so that gives me just sort of one last compressor serial wise, you know, there's just mm -hmm. one right in the channel. But so, yeah, I mean, I just wind up really usually with like uh, something like the MOG, the K comp thing that we were just talking about over here over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I wind up with something like that on the tape outs and then the Magnatech on an insert and then the, the one on the console and then possibly something like an 1176 in parallel on the main vocal. But I've definitely, in general, I've pared it down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Something that's happened to me a million times is that I've, I've done sort of recalls by ear, you know, like on consoles where I didn't bother taking a bunch of notes and then had to do the recall just by listening to my mix. And it's funny, like a lot of the crap that I had patched in was sort of used in the pursuit of finding the destination sonically for what the song really wanted to do. And, and probably if I had just kind of listened a bit longer and pushed around the faders a bit more, I would have found it without all that crap patched in. Mm -hmm. I'm by no means a purist. I'll, you know, patch 27 EQs on a kick drum if I have to, but the mm -hmm. including plugins coming out through hardware boxes and then, you know, whatever, and on the console. But the point being that I did recalls that sounded almost identical because it was mm -hmm. the same tracks, the same me, the same everything, same room. And they sounded almost identical, but then with the vocal up a dB or whatever I changed on it, and I used a third of the gear, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, because again, I would sort of be doing weird things like boosting in the rack and then cutting again at the console where I could have just kind of left it alone, yeah, you know, or whatever. Like I, I effectively made a zero out of six things. Uh, yeah, I know, you know exactly what you mean. And this is, a, I did a podcast episode, an article about this one, uh, 
called The Myth of a Thousand Little Choices. It's been one of the more popular articles and podcasts we've done recently. Mm-hmm. And it speaks to exactly this, where there's so many of these little choices we make, and each one seems so significant when we're making it. But then when you actually zoom out and step back, there was a few big choices you made that actually made a difference. And all those little ones were just kind of you thinking and finding the path and coming up with the end vision in your mind's yeah. ear to pursue it. And uh, that's an important thing to recognize. Now, when you're in the heat of it, it doesn't make sense to then go back and try to undo everything, unplug no, half of the course. gear and redo it. It's like all of those are there, not necessarily because they need to be, but because they're the machete you use to cut your path through to the right it's perspective. Sound. Yeah. It's absolutely perspective. I mean, put it this way. There's always a windier road that goes up the mountain. And then once you get up there, you're like, oh, I can see the highway, <laughs> right. the one that goes straight to where I was trying to get instead of yeah. these 8 million switchbacks on my way there. And, and, but, but I would have never achieved that elevation without hitting all these little switchbacks and getting up to the top of the mountain. And then you see the path. Yeah. You know, once you get to that, that vantage point, I mean, to me, that's, it's now having that perspective a bit more like the, you know, I definitely didn't get all these gray hairs being, you know, being careful <laughs> <laughs> with, with the patching and stuff mm-hmm. and getting yelled at by A&R. It's like, I'm, I'm happy now though, to be able to pursue, to be able to target something a bit more accurately. And I think that a lot of the greatest mix guys that I've ever met, it's like they're their ability to diagnose what a song needs mm. um, and then supply that input with whatever's right around them, like a clear mountain that's just doing it right at the console or whatever with minimal outboard, things like this. It doesn't mean that the goal is to do minimal outboard. It means the goal is to be able to recognize what you need to do to get it to the place you think it needs to get to. Right. And that's that's important. That makes a lot of sense to stick with your mountain analogy for a second. It's like every mix is like trying to get to the top of a mountain without having a map. But then once you've gone up enough mountains, you start to learn a thing or two about mountains and you can find a clearer path, even though you don't have a map, you know? Exactly. So yeah, yeah it's good stuff, man. Um, now, speaking of other engineers, are you the kind of guy who has been influenced by other producers or engineers, or are you influenced more by specific records? Are there guys who have you know helped you shape your idea of what things should sound like? Are there guys in your life who have been influential in your process today, I guess is my question. There's guys, guys. and girls. Yeah, I was about to say, guys and girls, I've got to get paid sure. about the colloquial, you know, guys, this isn't, uh, this isn't Spanish, so we've got to say guys and guys. Right. There are some yeah. major female engineers throughout history. Humans. So yes. There are humans. Are there human beings? Actually, yes. dude, but you have to admit, you know, people from Alpha Centauri as well. We can't leave them out. True. So yes. Are there so humans true. or extraterrestrials or uh, non-human uh, domesticated animals who have informed your process in, in all this. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, again, when I, when I was referencing something like Cosmo Matassa, it's like, it's, it's people that have influenced me because of like the way they navigate life rather than like what EQ they used on a snare drum. You know, I mean, some of the best, I always say that some of the best advice I ever got was in this industry was from Michael Brower and it was over lunch and it was about leaving early on Wednesdays to see my daughter. Mm. And, and it has, it had literally nothing to do with recording, but it has everything to do with it. It's how to have a life in audio, how to, how to become the person that is the engineer you wish you worked with when you were younger and a musician, you know, because then the, the person aspect of it first deliberately how to be the producer that's interesting enough to be in a room with that it's like without all the gear and without all the, the task at hand, people don't just run away. You know I mean? It's like most of my favorite producers always seem to have something fun to say about a myriad of topics Mm -hmm. and they, and they come off not just as intelligent, but fun and introspective and as, as human beings. And, and those examples to me have always been important. And, and I've, sometimes it's just for the day because I meet somebody randomly at AES and they join us for lunch, you know, or, or if it's just, uh, you know, whatever for, through whatever means, if it's somebody that worked on a band's last record and I meet them at the record release party, you know, or whatever it is, and they wind up being a great person. I'm like, wow, this matters. This actually matters. And, and I understand why you would work with that guy or girl, because they're great to be around. They, they have something about them that inspires confidence. It's like when you're getting on the plane, you know, and, and the, the, 
the pilot doesn't have to know everybody's life story or why they're going to where the plane's about to go. But if they're doing what they do with confidence, we can make a few assumptions like that the people want to live through the flight. They want it to go on time. You know, there's a bunch of parameters that are common to everybody getting on that plane. And most of them are very human. Mm -hmm. And based on either fear or urgency, as far as like they have a business need or whatever it is. And those factors are all present when I walk in a control room with people. Mm -hmm. And if I'm rocking back and forth and like sweating and looking nervous, just like the pilot, I'd probably get back off the plane. (laughs) If I saw the guy like reading the manual or the like how to fly for dummies book and, you know, shedding a quiet tear, I'm probably going to get back off the plane. I'm not going to inspire confidence. But in this case, being able to sit in front of a console and inspire confidence with people, like to me, that comes from being a, an actual human being and sensitive to what the people need in the room around you and, and very little to do with how much 4K I'm, I'm applying to the snare, you know? No, that makes a lot of sense. I have to admit, a lot of the guys who I've admired most, admired their work most, are well-rounded human beings who, in addition to being obsessed with the studio stuff and can nerd out as much as any of us, have a rest of their life. I mean, Michael Brower, we did an episode with him recently. It ended up being a popular one because he's it's fun to listen to him talk, but then you also find out things about him like... He doesn't stay there till midnight every night. He's trying to totally. leave by a certain time to live yeah. the rest of his well-rounded life. And I think for a while, I just saw this, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I saw this in an interview with him after I interviewed with him. I think he was a competitive cyclist for a little while, yeah. like while he was making these big records. It's like, yeah. you're fitting that into a life of being near the top of your game. I mean, you're taking time to step back. It's an interesting thing to think that you can... Hustling doesn't necessarily mean your nose is to the grindstone 16 hours every single day, but it means you're making big efforts where they matter. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about how you've, you know, work-life balance in your own life? Like when t- do you have any rules for yourself about, uh, you know, I can't ha- be a well-rounded person if I'm only in the studio every second, but I also can't be good at my craft if I'm not here enough. Do you have any rules or yeah. parameters you work in around that? Sure. I mean, I, I always book sessions at 10 AM to 8 PM and, you know, clearly that can sort of move around a little bit here or there based on the case, you know, like the black keys stuff that I did, I had to work a little later because there were people that were coming in later in the afternoon after Dan and Pat and I would make the track, like Q-tip would show up at four and I'm not just going to leave two hours later. You know (laughs) what I mean? Like it's, it would, it was cool, but But mostly it's like, basically it's like this to anybody who's an engineer at the moment and trying to set parameters in life. It's, it would be my advice specifically that if you say you're working 10 to eight and you stay till 805, you're a hero. Mm -hmm. If you don't set any parameters when you leave, no matter what time that is, you're an asshole. (laughs) It's a good one. It's, it's that simple. And so, and so basically setting up it's managing expectations, man. That's all it really is. And and being human when you need to be human and being superhuman when you need to. Like we'll get 10 times the amount of work done in this studio between 10 and 8 than like the full on stoner zone place that just like is, is like, bro, you can come in whenever, man. We'll go from like midnight to eight in the morning. It'll be sick. And then like nothing happens and the stuff is broken and Pro Tools crashing and all of that. But yeah, sure. You got to spend like 17 hours watching Pro Tools crash. It's like, if we keep it really, really, really professional and work during business hours that we define, it's amazing how All I seem to be able to make after a particular number of hours is mistakes. And and you can do it. You know what I mean? You can totally do it. Anybody who's ever come up through it and punched vocals on tape in the 16th hour of the session, it's like, yeah, okay, we can do it. But it's uncomfortable. And it's not when the best stuff happened. It was just to get it done because of a pinched budget. Mm -hmm. So it's like if we all work together on this and just book one more day, even if I have to like give a free day, it's like it it gives us some breathing room to be able to take a lunch break, you know, and actually have a working method that is creative and exciting and not just up against the the grindstone the whole time yeah that just doesn't that that it's never those moments that lead to anything particularly exciting for me you know nobody was ever like yeah we only had one second left and that was the best mix of my life (laughs) you know i mean you can get it done yet again but it's just not the fun way to work it's amazing how much you can get done in limited time once you start using that time 
productively because you know it's limited. And I can say this from having a daughter now who's two years old. I get things done in the two hour chunk that I have. So yeah. much more done in that two hours than I used to get done in eight hours. So exactly. there's something to be said for here are the parameters. So let's make the most of it. Let's focus. Let's care. Let's pay attention. So now I know you've been with us for about an hour now. So I don't want to keep you forever. I know you're a busy man with things to do. So I want to ask you one more uh, little kind of eddy of questions here. Hopefully we can get something uh, okay. out of it. I'm just curious about your process when it comes to mixing, how you approach it. If there's a certain place you start and then are there, is there, and then how do you know you're finished? I guess the whole middle part you can extrapolate on, but is there a way that you usually start where you say, I have things set up well, now I can begin. I'm starting in this type of section. I have this kind of uh, routing setup done. And is there uh, a click when you know that I'm done or close to done? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, I start off these days, if it's like a, a rock band, mm -hmm. right? So we can just assume fairly traditional instrumentation, drums, bass, guitar, maybe some keys, vocals. Um, I start with the vocal way up. I don't solo. I think the solo button is evil. It's like, basically it should just be called verify. And once you verify that's what, what's coming out of that channel is what you thought was coming out of that channel, then you're done with the verify button, you know? And I work in context the entire time, but what I'll do is I'll push the vocal really loud and see what it masks by just pushing everything to the background. You can still see my face, but I'm working on my hand right now. I didn't, it doesn't require that I have my hand in a void with nothing around it. I'm gonna like work on the, this part, you know? And so I wind up sort of shoving the faders around physically quite a bit. Mm. It's part of the reason that I like working on an analog console is the physicality of being able to just kind of push things around, like the elements, like I'm laying them out on the table mm -hmm. first and kind of seeing what I'm working with. I wind up with a snare vocal relationship that I'm happy with that's going to inform the rest of the, the mix. Like that mid-range is going to carry the DNA that informs how far to the left and how far to the right I can go. So it's like, even if the tilt changes, there's sort of a circle in the center and then a line that sticks out towards the low end and a line that sticks out towards the high end. And that circle still looks like a circle no matter where the tilt is, you know, no matter how tilted that line is. And so even though that's sort of an abused cliche, that, that snare and vocal relationship is what I'll lean on first and start muting things or turning them up or turning them down around that relationship. Because I can say, okay, that guitar part, the song doesn't die when I mute that guitar. The song dies when I mute the banjo, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, some unexpected element where it's like, wow, there's a lot of information in the mid range that just keeps this song moving and really spells out the voice leading or, you know, things about the arrangement that are important live in a particular element. And it's almost like you, you hit a mute button and it's like those little kids toys with the, the giraffe that goes floppy when you push the button. And then when you let go, it stands back up straight. It's like you wind up hitting a mute button and things go all floppy and it just kind of sounds like disjointed elements. And then you find that when you turn the bass on in this one song, everything seems to make sense again, the timing and feel of the guitar 16th notes or whatever that sound crappy against the hi-hat without the bass, all of a sudden with that groove locked in with the kick, let's say, you find that it now justifies the timing and feel of the 16ths in the guitar. Like you find these sort of keystone elements in the mix and I start to formulate a plan on how I'm going to present what's important about the mix and sort of can, can steer its rhythmic intensity towards or away from the elements that I've deemed to be important. Like what makes the transitions feel exciting? What generates transitional energy from pre-chorus to chorus? Is it the guitar? Is it the keys? Is it the vocal? Is it the tambourine? Is it the fill? You know, whatever it is in the drums, is it the toms? So coupling that with the gesture that's being expressed. So whether somebody's talking about love or hate or loss or, you know, whatever the, the sentiment is that's being expressed, that also has to factor 
it's like this kind of 3D evolving puzzle for me where you have to take a gajillion variables into account and then place everything in a flattering position to support the core sentiment being expressed. Like everyone is working as a team to say, I love you. Or everyone's working as a team to say, we hate you or we're angry or whatever it is, whatever's being expressed, not just in the lyric, but in the timbres that were captured themselves. If I'm just working as a mix engineer and not as a producer that happens to be mixing my own stuff, you know? So moving towards that sentiment starts to inform any kind of move like guitar, big rock guitars that are inherently really good and carry the right idiom to express some sort of tough, angry moment. Clearly you can lean on those more than the strings that might be present in the chorus in a melancholy track, but you wouldn't make them dominant compared to the angry guitar stuff. If what's being expressed is rocking all night long and Harley Davidson wheelies you know, or whatever, whatever angry rock dudes talk about these days, <laughs> tattoo shops and stuff, you know, and, um, skulls. It's probably skulls. It's always been skulls. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Still skulls yeah. is what I should have said. Mm -hmm. Um, but in that case, it's like then the timbre of the entire mix should then make sense with the timbre of the individual elements and the sentiment being expressed. It's like, the first sentence, the cover of the book should make me want to open it. The first sentence of the first chapter should make me want to read the first paragraph. The first paragraph should take me all the way to the end of the chapter and so on. All of a sudden I'm at the end of the mix and I'm forgetting that there, there was ever, I don't remember necessarily exactly what the first word of the book was. And yet all those words were there to support that big culminating ending, you know, like where, where there's a resolution and you feel like, the book melts away and you're just kind of in the world that the words are creating. It's the same thing with the monitors for me. It's like everything melts away and I'm just in the world that's being created by the combination of elements, sounds, and gestures that are coming out of the speakers at me. Um, that's when I know I'm done. Great. So you, you start to know when you're done, when you're kind of losing yourself in a good way in in it and not uh, and not thinking in such a zoomed in microscopic analytical way about things but you're just kind of yeah you find but, yourself and and, and i start to and i start to run out of shit to do yeah. i mean it's i mean that's a big part of it is like you sort of throw up your hands like that's just good i mean we're there and and also i mean a sort of distraction -y, you know distraction focus type of moment usually happens where you you're not listening as intently because you are running out of things to do. So you're sort of naturally backing off from that place in your brain that's super on point and listening, you know, with a razor uh, in your brain. And, and you wind up with this sort of less focused kind of like, should I finish up? What time is it? Am I hungry? Do I want tea? And at the same time, at that moment, sometimes there's something that was like staring you in the face for the last 30 minutes just kind of jumps out at me. And I'll go, oh yeah, that harmony just is cranked in the bridge. And I must have really loved that an hour ago because it's really loud, you know? And so you turn that down 3 dB and print your mix. You know, whatever snaps me out of the moment is the first thing to get kind of attenuated or dealt with in one way or the other, you mm -hmm. know? And then I know I'm done. If there aren't any moments that make me go, I don't know about that thing like is that just taking me out of this narrative that's being created really interesting stuff man i i feel like i'm gonna go back myself and listen to that last passage a few times i think there's a lot of uh, beautiful uh imagery in there as well as really wonderful ideas that i think people can kind of parse out and i love what you're saying about starting with the mid-range and starting with the the snare and the vocal i don't think everyone approaches it that way but for those who haven't it's definitely a, a focus worth trying if they're feeling stuck or lost in their process i i always am amazed when i listen to masters i i get in some of them are of one quality and some are way way higher quality and i'm surprised often how the best mixers i hear are unafraid to push their vocal and push their snare drum and make totally. them, yeah. Like if you get the mid range of the record right, it's easy to get everything else right. If you spend well, everyone judges the volume of the track, meaning like when you put it on mm -hmm. in the car. I mean, it's really just if if my aunt is in her car on her commute and she's turning on a a, 
a, a track or whatever and she's turning it up she's going to judge the volume the playback volume by the vocal and that snare vocal relationship is kind of like how big the band is compared to the vocalist mm. and then everything else like is it a bassy mix compared to what compared to like your bad brains record yes Com <laughs> compared to the compared to the vocal snare relationship mm -hmm. maybe maybe not but that's like that becomes the flag in the sand in my opinion when people are judging the overall playback volume and then i will tweak things towards the end i'll go back to the kick of eight million times as right. i shape the mid but i'll keep going back to it so that what happens is i'm i'm watching the cones on the atcs and where I intend the playback volume to be. I'm now not sweating these motors so hard that they have to work overly hard to reproduce what I'm trying to say with the mix. So it's like, I'll keep going back to that low end and go, you know what? At the playback volume that's intended here, it's just sweating the cones like crazy. So let's figure out how to sort of give the illusion of extension without so much actual 40, like just making those things jump out of the boxes at me, you know, or figure out what's making them work too hard, almost in a mastering sense. Like, is there just a, a surplus of 55 there? And if I pull it in 3 dB across the entire mix, I wind up noticing that the cones aren't working so hard and we get tons more clarity and definition in the sort of impact of the kick drum rather than just the overall kind of like woolly low end that maybe I had wound on when I was listening quieter earlier in the mix. It's wonderful. It's interesting, a different perspective than we've heard on this podcast yet. So th thank you so much for sharing it. Joel, it has been fantastic talking to you. I've got to say, you've been an inspiration to me, the way you work, the way you think about this stuff, your confidence in your approach and your you know ability to make really bold choices and keep moving forward. And it is impressive. I think it should be impressive to any of us what you guys have been able to build from really, really humble beginnings at original Studio G to what is now going to be, I think, one of the biggest uh, facilities in all of New York. So man, kudos and thanks Thank for being you, here, dude. All thanks right. so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Great to talk to you always. Great to talk to you, dude. For those people who want to hear more from you, want to get in touch, want to follow you, what are the best places for them to, uh, to kind of look you up or, or get in touch if they need to? Instagram or email me directly. All right. And for Studio sure. G website is just studiogbrooklyn.com? Correct. And what are you on Insta? You're Joel Hamilton, I believe. Is that right? Correct. Good that stuff. Right. So definitely yeah, check this man out. Um, Joel Hamilton, thanks for being here. One last big shout out to our sponsors and an announcement. First, the announcement, MixCon. MixCon is coming weekend of July 27th and 28th. We're going to have some major producer engineers like Tony Maserati up there. We're going to have Dan Corniff, who's done some like amazing multi-platinum kind of major heavy music records. Uh, Jeff Ellis worked with Frank Ocean a long time, won a couple of Grammys with that guy. So definitely come check it out. That is MixCon. Check it out, mix-con.com. Also, thanks to our sponsors, Plugin Alliance. Interesting thing is behind Joel's head, I see a whole bunch of Plugin Alliance plugins. There's there's Mog Audio things. There's the Alicia. I think Chandler. There's some Chandler stuff that Plugin Alliance makes. So I get why they're like, oh, we want to be on a podcast with Joel. It's like, yeah, you've like tried to reissue a bunch of his gear that nobody else has reissued. So the Empressor, man, they make an amazing Empressor plugin. Right? Actually, it's a really good one. Yeah, yeah. So definitely check those guys out. If you're listening to this when it comes out, right here at the end of June, there's a huge summer sale going on at plugin-alliance.com. That's plugin-alliance.com. Check out anything they make for free there. And if you act this week, there's some big discounts. Also, big shout out and thanks to Sound Toys sponsoring once again. Sound Toys, one of my favorite plugin companies, making really, really fun stuff. I see Joel nodding in the background there. I know he's a fan and a user. Also, thanks to Eventide, Eventide Audio, making really cutting edge, unusual, interesting effects for like the past 40 something years and still making cutting edge, forward looking stuff today. So, check them out. They Sound have some Toys. great stuff coming up, but I have an NDA with them. All <laughs> right. Joel, no speaking. There's some on amazing now, but... stuff coming out, man. Yeah. Whoa. Coming All right. soon. Good stuff, man. Well, Joel, thank you again for being here. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. See you next time.